and also let me have, have the sharing program for me. Okay, I think I got it. Thank you. We will start our session within two minutes. Now we have with us Dr. Shashi Kumar, CDAC Mumbai, Director at CDAC Mumbai. We welcome you, sir, in this workshop. Thank you. <clears throat> he, he has initiated and nurtured a number of projects in the area of e-learning, and today he is going to guide us um, regarding the concept of virtual labs, various types of resources which can be developed, the purpose of virtual labs and how resources, how these experiments can be developed and disseminated. Over to Shashi Kumar. Sir. Thank you. So I, I hope uh, I am audible, visible, and my slide is also visible. Right? Yes, sir. Very good. So uh, good evening and welcome to this uh, session on um, virtual labs. So I noticed that uh, this is basically the South India um, audience that we have today. <clears throat> yes, so uh, what I will be doing is uh, to in, uh, basically give you a feel of what virtual labs are and um, you know uh, how to use them. And then uh, towards the end, we'll spend some time on what you can do to contribute or to even build uh, virtual labs within whatever is possible. Okay, so that's the that's the agenda that I will keep for today. Okay, so this whole journey started um, uh, with, um, uh, you know, SIDAC Mumbai and Amrita University coming together and building about uh, 200 virtual labs covering science, maths, and English for school students. And these were released to uh, all the school students in India. I mean, it's, it's open on the web under the allabs.edu.in uh, website, okay? And um, so um, and about 60,000 odd uh, teachers training has also happened uh, to promote or to help uh, facilitate adoption of these virtual labs. Okay, so, uh, and in the pandemic, uh, this turned, to, turned out to be a game changer because uh, while lectures could be done by, you know, using a mobile phone or to, uh, recording your lecture and sharing it with the students, allowing the student to do practical uh, labs for physics, chemistry, and all that was a big challenge. And uh, this uh, tool actually became a very handy system for at least to meet the requirements of labs during the pandemic time when the schools were closed. And therefore, you know, there was a lot of excitement about um, you know making use of these in a larger scale. Plus, uh, the national, uh, the new educational policy also emphasizes quite a lot on building virtual labs and using technology for enhancing the quality of education. So, with this, uh, we are now in the um, stage of, you know, doing about 600 more labs 
uh, that is going to, getting, going to get built up you know, over the next couple of years on covering almost all aspects of school education. So this is a grand repository of information that you know you can share with your students and this can actually help them learn a lot of things in, in a much richer ways than what we have been doing. So uh, <clears throat> if you go to the um, OLAPS uh, page, this is, this is what we started with, uh, the olaps.edu.in. Okay, and uh, the page looks something like this. So we have, um, you know, separate things for uh, physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, and English. You can go inside any of these and then choose which class you want to take uh, your labs into and then each of the labs are listed. And for each of those labs, uh, elaborate information is provided. Okay, so this is the resource that uh, we have created and which kind of led to this uh, movement happening across, um, across India. Okay. And it um, and we uh, because of this interest in it and the um, uh, interest being shown by um, uh, the Ministry of Education uh, right up to honorable PM level, this is now getting a new uh, you know uh, visibility as well. So on the Diksha platform, which most of you may be familiar with, all these labs, these two hundred labs, have been linked to the Diksha platform. So. When a student is actually going and to, to look at study material for a topic, you can also get the links to the corresponding labs. There is also a direct link to the um, laboratories, uh, the labs itself, which I'll show you in a, in a minute. So these, these labs are now available through Diksha portal you can come to, or you can go directly to labs.edu.in and access these labs. The labs are completely available free. There are no uh, cost or there is no uh, you know, formal registration or something that is required to access these labs. <clears throat> so this is what the Diksha portal um, access will looks like. If you go to this URL, that is diksha.gov.in slash virtuallabs.html, you will get to a page where which shows these, uh, the grade 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Currently 6, 7, 8, uh, there is really nothing there. We are in the process of building these. 9, 10, 11, 12, you can actually access these contents. And when you go down, it will, I mean, you click on this explore button, you will get uh, two arrow marks in Hindi medium and English medium, which tells you which medium that lab is available in. And then if you click on any of the medium, you will get a subject choice like mathematics, physics, chemistry. You click on that, it will take you to a list of labs of that class in on that subject in that medium. So that's how uh, the Diksha portal uh, lays it out for you. So and I'm sure many of you would have tried these labs during the last couple of years uh, for your uh, for your students' requirements and all that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, so that's how you access it either through a labs portal or to the Diksha portal. Okay, so why are we so excited about labs in education? I mean, I think everybody knows. Uh, so now I'm not talking about virtual labs per se. I'm talking about laboratory activities in an education per se. Right? So we all understand uh, that, uh, you know, uh, studying uh, things like Newton's law or Hooke's law or, uh, you know, convex um, uh, the focal length of a convex uh, lens, all of these purely using formulas and the diagrams in your textbook doesn't give you a feel of what it actually looks like in practice. So how, do, how does it actually work? So giving students a hands-on feel of the lessons that have been learned is, is something that is very important. So people, usually teachers would do uh, some demonstrations and they do them, uh, those kind of things will be set up for uh, imparting that kind of information, right? Or um, you now we are actually, um, uh, when, you, when you have a laboratory, you can actually uh, perform this activity live and the students can understand it better, right? So connecting the theory to the real life. So I can actually show that, you know, uh, when the light falls on a prism, it actually uh, changes into multiple colors uh, with a different frequency. And then you, so all of, all of that activities can be physically demonstrated in a uh, laboratory activity. So these are things that usually one doesn't do in, in a classroom. And uh, we also want to uh, emphasize on learning how to do experiments because for a science or maths uh, student, um, um, uh, experimenting is a way of learning, right? So it's a key paradigm in science. 
so we want to also want to tell the student that you know how to how to what is the structure of an experiment you start with the hypothesis you add, you set up the experimental methodology then you conduct the experiment you look at collect the results evaluate etc so experiment as a key paradigm is also something that you want to to explain to the student and without a lab you really cannot do this actually there and uh, the other advantage of do using our, our labs is better internalization of the content so like uh, people say you know when you know, when you listen to a lecture like what you are doing now after the lecture is over you would have forgotten uh, you know 70 80 90% of whatever was told if i show you some activities you would possibly remember a little bit more of it but if you are involved in what what is being communicated you will understand it better so tell me i will forget show me i may remember involve me i will understand so this is a very famous quote uh, in the particularly from popular in the field of education and uh, so this is also what the current interest in active learning says right so involve the student even if it is question of pressing the button minimally to fill up the blanks to you know navigate or making choices getting the student physically involved in the in the activity being uh, you know performed is is improve is means productive in terms of improving the quality of uh, learning that takes place so all of these are uh, important reasons for us to have uh, labs and which is why you know from uh, you know maybe class 6 7 onwards you have actual laboratories for different subjects physics and uh, you know the uh, science subjects and even maths right but what happens in practice is that um, you know having a physical lab you know imagine a chemistry lab with uh, so much of uh, storage of uh, different acids chemicals beakers uh, pipette burette and all that or a physics lab with uh, various equipment springs and measuring devices voltmeter ammeter all of these will call, may require a fair amount of cost that's physical um, you know, money investment and also it is space requirement because storing all these things and making it available for students even if it is just at a group level or at an individual level these are uh, significant in, uh, requirements for physical infrastructure and equipment and this is something that uh, sometimes is a challenge for many schools to do um, to afford it in a liberal way so therefore you know we start restricting we'll say that you know physics lab will be for the all the classes at thursday from 3 to 4 so at that time only these set on my labs are set up they come they perform some activity and then they go back right so that one hour is all that they will get for their physics lab activity to be performed then right? and uh, there is also the challenge of uh, the raw material cost that comes in right if you want to do magnesium burning or how to show them you know, um, you know acid base reaction you need to buy those raw material and they need to be given to the student and they basically get used up in the process so because of all that we have been doing this by providing limited access to lab and that to in you know, a group mode so that the usage of these things is controlled further even if i had physical lab there is still a lot of activities which i cannot demonstrate or i cannot show in a physical lab like for example when you when i am demonstrating a pendulum and i'll show that you know what how what happens to the period with the different materials so somebody would want to say what happens when the gravity changes now i want to know what happens to the pendulum in moon or in mars i cannot do that by even if i have a physical lab because i don't have a control over the gravity right there are also things like a dangerous reaction suppose you know let's say a building catches fire and how do you respond to it or um, even uh, you know sodium reaction with water uh, water or potassium with water because these are these can be little dangerous to perform in, in a classroom then uh, there is also time taking task and very fast paced phenomena <clears throat> let's say if i want to show, the, to show you the life cycle of a mosquito which takes multiple days or i want to show how and um, you know an atomic structure changes which may happen in, in less than a millisecond these are also things which is not amenable to a physical lab the way we know it so what can we do about it what we can do is to look at uh, virtual labs virtual labs is a um, a mimic of, of the same physical lab with as much honesty as uh, is desirable for that particular requirement okay so there is also something called remote labs which i will not get into today uh, we will focus our attention on virtual labs which are basically simulation labs okay 
so uh, simulation labs or virtual labs in, in this case that we are calling we've been calling it all labs so we may use that term also sometime so what happens is that i so on the computer system like what you are listening to me sitting at wherever you are in the different states uh, you know andhra pradesh tamil nadu whatever wherever you are you are listening to me who is sitting in bombay right so through the software system through the computer interface you are able to access a, so a program which is you know being run from somewhere which gives you a feel of what the lab looked like so when you do a let's say hooke's law experiment when you start the session you will actually find a, a stand with a spring suspended to it and bunch of weights there you drag a weight and put it on the spring the spring oscillates and come to rest then you there is a scale lying around you pick it measure the length of elongation and you can plot a graph so all this without touching anything physical all with with your mouse and keyboard you can actually do all of these activity so the software simulations of these uh, activities are implemented and these are made available to you online so i'll show you a quick demonstration of this uh, virtual labs um, um, after this intro so you will get a feel if you have not actually tried this out now the the great advantage of this is that is a unconstrained availability these are software programs so uh, like olabs.edu.in you can access it any any time of the day and night from any part of uh, the world you can access it as long as you have internet internet connection there right so we don't really care how many times you are accessing it you can spend hours on it or you can spend just a few minutes if you are comfortable with it so availability is now opened up to all essentially uh, unlimited amount right at the same time i don't have a cost of raw materials and physical space and you know equipments etc because these are all simulated environments so once it is developed it's a very trivial cost to make it available to as many people and today we have lakhs of students uh, from uh, schools who are accessing these labs at uh, at their convenience so we also i mean you know we should remember that uh, these simulations are not equal into a physical uh, lab so for example when you are de determining the boiling point of uh, water by actually boiling it put a thermometer there what happens if you keep on boiling or putting the uh, you know heating heaters heat source uh, indefinitely on eventually the water will completely evaporate the, uh, the vessel will get hot it will melt and all that right so when you do a simulation we will say that you know we will make the assumption that it is only for this lab activity <coughs> so once the water starts boiling we will stop the simulation capability so it was it is not that you know the whole room will come to fire and all that so there are boundaries uh, sometimes which may be ignored They're like uh, spring is operational only in a linearity region simplifications may apply and but this is is a great uh, great help that i can manipulate the time scale so i can do a mosquito life cycle in 1 minute or 2 minute by actually fast forwarding the steps i can do an atomic reaction in a you know 5 minute interval which would have happened in 1 millisecond by actually stretching the time so i can control the time scale and make the information or the process visible or understandable by the students so and as i mentioned earlier that i can also simulate uh, gravity as in moon or jupiter so you can actually virtually take your pendulum to the moon and actually show what happens to the uh, the period of the pendulum and all that so these are all um, you know uh, uh, helps that virtual labs provide to you in terms of uh, you know uh, giving the student a better uh, environment for learning so it can be a very powerful instructional device because you can actually demonstrate a lot of capabilities without investing uh, cost or resources or you know sharing uh, you know the, the limited uh, lab uh, lab facility that is available now some of you might actually wonder that you know if i have these virtual labs then why need physical labs my answer is yes you must have them because uh, you know i think all of, all of you would realize that you know if you if you uh, when you go to uh, when you think of a chemistry lab i'm sure that the smell that comes to your mind is uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, smell or you know uh, those kind of things right now in my virtual lab there is no smell at all or to be able to feel the heat of uh, you know an acid base reaction which is not possible so a physical lab obviously has its space to get give you that overall experience of what that activity is about 
So we would say that you should look at these virtual labs as amplifiers and not replacements of physical lab. Okay, so that way, if you spend half an hour or one hour in the uh, in the physical lab, you can actually make three or four hours out of it by augmenting it with the virtual labs. Okay, that's a, that's the right way of using these technological resources that we are pro uh, providing for you. Now, adopting virtual labs, you have to have, uh, you know, in order to use the virtual labs, we, although I said it is simulation, simulation is one part of that. You need a comprehensive ecosystem. For example, let's say if you look at uh, Hooke's law, um, you, you suspend different weights, you get uh, different values, and you are supposed to plot those values in a graph paper, look at the shape of the curve that is uh, being formed. Now, if I just do simulation, all of these activities have to be kept, uh, kept somewhere and then that information has to be shared. So what we are doing is we are actually providing a complete um, uh, comprehensive ecosystem to reduce time to use, right? And so what happens is, you know, if you go to Hooke's law in uh, all labs, you actually find a, a graph plotting things. There is a table that you can fill online. So you do the activity, measure the time, the elongation of the value, you know, spring and enter the value in that table. And when the three or four values are rendered, you will automatically get a graph, right? So the whole activity from beginning to end, you are able to perform within the virtual lab uh, environment, okay? So it's a comprehensive ecosystem. I'll show you a little more information about it. So even for when you want to refer to any, what is that formula to compute the, um, you know, uh, the coefficient of uh, whatever, you can actually go and refer to it right on the, within the lab environment. So we don't have to go and hunt for a textbook and all that there. We understand the pedagogical aspects and adopt relevant usage pattern. So how is the lab to be performed as recommended by CBSE or NCRT or whatever, whichever is the board that you're following. We, we are actually adopting that same process and try to align to this as much as possible. We provide a rich set of affordances and guidances in the, in, during the lab environment. We also I'll show you in, during the demonstration. So, like in, if in the case of a pendulum, we will show you, we'll, we'll allow you to change the material, the size of the blob, the gravity value. So these are affordances which you can change in the lab environment itself. Okay. And so therefore, it is very well integrated into the curriculum if you do all of this, that the teacher can say, look, go, go and perform uh, you know, uh, lab number 43, and it is as good as uh, doing a physical lab in those cases. Social studies, yeah, it is not yet done. And um, uh, the, yeah, we are, we are in the process of doing it. But towards the end of this presentation, I'll tell you a little more about uh, those. So that is coming. I mean, I'm, I'm reading from your comments on the chat box also, okay. And uh, states of permission to localize the content. Uh, yes, we can, because this is open content. We have actually asked the states to provide help in translating it to the local languages. Some states have uh, um, given us some support and uh, labs are available in those languages to some level. But if uh, some of you can you know, come forward and give us the content in those languages, we can certainly make these labs available in there. The flow localization, we have not yet currently worked on it, but we can certainly look at uh, that also as we go along. Okay. So uh, the ecosystem that I was referring to is the, the theory that is relevant to the lab, understanding of the process, the auxiliary requirements like plotting, measurement. <coughs> so in our online lab um, environment, if, you, if uh, you need to take the measurement of a length, okay, the elongation of a spring or the you know distance between the lens and the image, we actually provide a virtual scale also, a real, real life looking scale which you can position wherever you want in whichever angle you want and actually measure the distance in that scale. So it's actually like you're doing it in a real uh, uh, scale. Plus, we also include some review questions and references. So these are also available to you. So you can, you actually have the entire setup in addition to the core simulator. So this is what uh, typically a lab would look like in uh, virtual lab. So you have the theory. So if you click on the theory tab, you can actually get all the formulas and information that is relevant to that. Procedure tells you how to do that uh, things. The simulator is where you actually do the lab. So the currently the screen shows you 
a view of the lab activity. So you can see the, the power source, the meter, voltmeter, rheostat, the switch, and there are these wires. So you can draw a, a line from one place to the other. And you know, like this, you know, in the virtual mode, you can actually draw a line and it will actually become a connector there. Okay. And you can also control a lot of parameters here. So you can see the, the metal, the length of wire, diameter, resistance, all of these values are changeable. So this is what I meant by the affordances. Okay, so this is how the lab, these labs have been set up. So they are essentially readily usable by you. <coughs> Sorry, my bad. throat is a little bad today. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure that this doesn't get interrupted. Okay, so all apps is ready to use and we, the, whatever we're going to add to it also will continue to be in that mode. Compared to the many simulators which are available online, we are providing a complete ecosystem. It is consistent in terminology because we are following completely NCRT, CPSC teachers and their curriculum. And it is completely compliant with the NCRT curriculum. So it's directly usable for if, your curriculum, if you are following the NCRT curriculum. If there are variations, we can customize, but that requires a little bit of effort. We'll have to look at that. Okay. And all the content has been reviewed and approved by CPSC teachers. Right? And um, then one of the great things about this is that they are not animations uh, or a video recording. They are actually simulations where the student has to interact. So at every point, he has to you know, light the burner or, or pour the acid into the space or put the litmus paper. So he has to do activities in a virtual environment and see what is the result that is coming, uh, observe that result and, um, you know, report it or plot it. Okay, so there is a high degree of interactivity for the learner and also the multiple affordances. Now, how do we use um, this, um, uh, these labs? There are many ways a teacher can make use of it. So here are three, four of them that I'm, I'm noting it down. So as I said, the physical lab usually is a very constrained uh, time slot, right? So you three to four means by the, and when you go there at three o'clock, you know, uh, you don't understand what is there waiting for you, what you are supposed to do and what is expected to happen there, right? So I, I remember my labs in schools, which was you know, pretty much like that. So uh, before you actually send the students to the physical lab, you can actually take them through the virtual lab and show them that, see, this is what you're going to see there. This is the idea. This is what you want to do. When you do, do these, this activity, this is what is going to happen. And this is what you should observe. So you can prepare the student much better to make use of that one hour much more effectively than what you would have been able to do otherwise. In exactly similar way, Given that in the physical lab, you are able to explore only one or two scenarios, when they come back, you can actually elaborate in more detail by asking them to go and do a virtual lab and try out other combinations which you never did in the physical lab. Right? So if you did two, two weights or three weights in the Hooke's law, you can ask them to try with different combinations. You can ask them to do more reflection questions. What would happen if I put a very large weight? What happens if the weight is too small? Okay, so there are all these things you also you can do. When you're teaching the material in the class, not even as a lab, just as a, when I'm teaching, let's say, Hooke's law or, you know, focal length of a um, uh, lens, I can actually again open up the virtual lab, show the setup and see what is the behavior. Okay, which is something that is too much of a luxury so far. But using these labs, you can actually make your instructional sessions also more effective. Right, so you can actually show them, see, this is how it oscillates. So there is an oscillation when it comes to set, and this is the kind of length that you would expect. Right. And it is also an active learning thing because it's a highly interactive material that you are providing. You are uh, the you can actually uh, tell the student, okay, now put this weight and tell me what is the reading that you got. <laughs> so everybody will give me some numbers and you can say, oh, okay, that is right, but maybe this is not the way you should do it. And, you know, uh, more interactive discussion questions and all that. So these are all possible uh, usage scenarios that you can um, try it out when, you know, when you want to try use these labs in the online mode. Okay. Now, um, yeah, so let me quickly switch you to um, uh, uh, the OLAPS platform. I'll walk you through a little bit of, uh, you know, quick look at it. Since this is not 
uh, tutorial on virtual labs, I will not elaborate too much. If there is time at the end, we can come back and look at it more. So, um, since I think uh, occasionally chat messages are coming, I presume that uh, I am audible and, um, you know, maybe if one or two of you can just confirm that everything is fine so far. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Well. So, uh, um, yeah, um, I think some uh, AP Vasanta from Andhra Pradesh has said, you know, uh, geographical part. That is something we are doing. I think it should be very, uh, very quickly, th this will come to you. Uh, what we are doing is, uh, for example, uh, you know, states and capitals, important cities and, you know, in, in India, um, the identifying countries using their borders. So there is a lot of activities relating to, uh, you know, uh, the uh, earth and its, uh, you know, various aspects that we are trying to do through uh, virtual labs. So a lot more of these things you can actually see on the portal as uh, um, as we speak. I mean, I have about 20 groups of uh, people working on um, labs for you know maths and um, other subjects right now. So expect a lot of things to happen. Okay, with that, let me switch to um, this um, lab mode. So is, are, is everybody able to see this um, OLAB screen? Physics, chemistry, biology? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go to the physics screen here. So the lab has a lot of material. So here is on the top right is where you can see the, you know, the language selector. So you can choose Hindi, Malayalam, Marathi. The, many of the labs were translated to these four languages uh, at that time. And um, yeah, so let's say I go to physics um, uh, there. So you can see on the screen class 12, class 11, class 10, and uh, you can see the typical lab-like environment. So I'm going to choose uh, one of these ones. Um, let me see, convex mirror. Yeah, I think something which I checked, okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so. I'm going to choose this one, con concave mirror focal length method. Okay, so you can see the theory, uh, procedure, animation, all of these are available here. I'm going to go directly to the simulator. Okay, so and you can see the scale here. Okay, I uh, don't know if I can get to the annotator. Okay, I think it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, so if I if, uh, you can see the the scale on the bottom, and uh, you have a highlighted version of the scale which you can see on the top. Okay, and because it, the, uh, this um, lens is currently sitting at uh, 150, so it is showing you that. Okay, so I'm going to put the light on. Okay, so the light is on, and you can see from the light source, the light goes and hits the mirror and reflects back to the to everywhere including the screen okay now in order to find the focal length i will need to move uh, the mirror the object and the screen okay between these three i have to find a appropriate position so that uh, you know the sharp image will form so the movement is done by adjusting this uh, affordance here on the left side <coughs> distance between mirror and object Okay, mirror and uh, object. So I'm going to change this. You can see as when we move, we move that. And as the pointer moves, you can see uh, the scale on the top also is, uh, is showing you an updated position. So I'm currently at 113 centimeter from the, the screen. Okay, so you can, now we can move this uh, around. And then uh, I can also move this mirror and uh, see where what where i want to show so for example when i come bring it somewhere here the near the focal length you will actually find uh, an image is forming there see okay so uh, yeah i can move this a little bit more so when you move that when i when i'm near the focal length in this case, it is indicated by the light crossing, but in reality, you don't get that crossing. You would experiment with it. So now you can see on the scale that wherever uh, my screen is, that is at zero. From there, 
the mirror is at you know 15.9 cm right or 15.9 mm in this case i think so you can actually measure uh, the distance is actually given here also on the left 15.9 cm okay so you can adjust these and um, you know and make your record saying yes this is the focal length that i got okay and if you want to see okay so th this is this is how you can do this and i can switch off the light and my experiment is over <clears throat> right so like this you can uh, wander around with uh, you know so much of physics labs and maths labs and etc i'll show you maybe a little bit of maths lab and uh, then i will continue with my uh, talk okay so please sit not I'm using open. I think it is giving me some trouble. So let me um, share it from my uh, net only. Okay, so I have kept it here. Are you are you able to see the convex mirror focal length screen now? Or are you seeing the open open uh, board? Open yeah. board, sir. Okay, so I think let me unshare it and share it fresh. Okay, uh, yeah, convex length. Right. Okay, so uh, now I'm going back to the home page and let me try something on uh, maths. So there is volume of sphere, Pythagoras theorem, surface area of a cylinder. So and tangents drawn from an external point. So I'm going to just take one of these. So here also you see the theory procedure animation simulator, and I'm going to go to the simulator. Okay, so maths, of course, is, there is no real experiment. It's just that I want to try various combinations and see whether the if the, uh, the result actually holds. So here on the left, I'm getting instruction: select a point on a scale to draw a circle. So just to keep the um, length. So I've chosen a three centimeter radius. So a circle has been drawn. Click on the workbench anywhere outside to get a point. Now I want to draw tangents from outside the circle. So I have to click anywhere, I will get a tangent. So I'm going to click here. So click on point P to draw two tangents. I'm going to draw two tangents here. Okay, so it, it's going to basically draw two tangents. It will just touch the circle and go. Click on center O to draw two perpendicular lines which intersects the point of intersection of circle and tangents. Click on sender O. Well, this drawing we are um, not, uh, you know, asking you to do because the precision that is required online will be very difficult. So we are drawing it for you. But you can actually put a, um, you know, like you on the left side. Uh, so there, I think there is no particular tool. So you you can actually use a protractor or something and actually check whether these lengths are correct or wrong. Okay, and you also have a grid here which gives you an idea about what is the radius uh, that is that is used and all that so click on the points of intersection of radius and tangent radius and tangent is uh, this one i clicked that I, it has given a number uh, a and b and click on triangle aop okay so a a o p which is this one and uh, drag the mirror image of a triangle apo outside Okay, so I'm going to draw that. Uh, click on this to flip it. Uh, okay, so now I have to basically drag this and in, in such a way that this is aligned with this POB. Okay, uh, I think there must be a way to align this. Double click on it, okay. Yeah, so it has actually done that for me. So you can see that uh, these two triangles are absolutely equal because it has done. So, and the inference is OP and OPB completely cover each other. Therefore, length of tangent to PI is equal to tangent B. So if you draw multiple tangents from an external point, they will have the same length. 
So that's what we wanted to show. And now you can try with the different uh, bigger circles, smaller circle, closer disk uh, point, further point, all of that you can experiment with it. <clears throat> okay, so this is how the labs are organized. Uh, if uh, there is time, I'll come back to uh, show you more of this. Otherwise, let me go through the presentation. Uh, yeah. So, right. So, lab specific affordances in each lab, a set of affordances are provided. And these are chosen based on the expectations and requirements. So, for a pendulum, it could be the wire length, the value of G, material of pulp, and so on. If you want to do tense conversion in, uh, in, uh, in language, it could be the source and target sensors. And we also provide a lot of uh, mechanisms so that you don't actually create unnecessary mistakes. Like, for example, when you're typing, you may make a spelling error. So, we minimize uh, fresh typing that you will need to do. Tables are provided to record data. Plotting is provided. So, all of these are provided to you in the online environment. So, virtual labs are usually very highly interactive content and usable at an individual level. So, it's not something like you, you might want to focus more on this. And there are some chat comments. So, let me see. Okay, somebody is saying screen is not visible. I don't know which one. Um, do we need to register to access all apps? No, you don't have to. It may ask you for some uh, basic information, but that is only to kind of identify um, uh, for tracking information. So, no, not a big uh, constraint per se. Okay, and then wonderful. What about morning session? Okay, okay. All the rest is your attendance issue, so I'm okay with it. Okay, the content need to be positioned in the curriculum by the teacher. So, as a teacher, you will tell that okay, at this point, this lab activity has to be performed with this objective, with this kind of output to be produced. Okay, so that integration is uh, something that you, as a teacher, would do. And um, since we are talking about content creation, I want to move a little bit towards building these kind of labs. Why is it so challenging? Why are we not getting so many labs automatically coming out? So virtual labs are basically software programs. These are actually computer programs that are written with a lot of sophistication in order to build the simulation component. Okay. And uh, therefore, um, it is not easy. I mean, and, but then, you know, like, uh, let's say video or, um, you know, video recording, if you had asked them 10 years back uh, to do a video recording, you know, you will go to the studio, there is all kinds of fancy lighting, all that setup to be done. And then, you know, recording has to be done in a very controlled mode and all that. Today, you use your mobile phone and actually uh, do the recording very comfortably. I mean, even a uh, six, seven year old child can actually do a good, a good amount of video recording just using a mobile phone. Right? So a lot of technology are coming out to be much simpler to use over the over the period. But given that virtual labs are software programs, right now building this is a little bit of a challenge for normal, you know, standard teachers, particularly those who are not teaching computer science, it is still going to be a little uh, difficult for you. <coughs> but <clears throat> I'll show you some things that you can do, uh, maybe even then. <coughs> so, the core of a virtual lab is a simulator, which is a software program, which mimics the intended behavior. And these are simulator because in the sense it will actually capture the equations governing the period of the pendulum or like maths lab, when I'm drawing a tangent, I have to make sure that it follows the properties of a tangent. Okay, so it's not enough to just simply draw a line. Okay, so all of these uh, concepts are embedded in the software itself. So that's why software develop building is a little complicated. The ecosystem is not a complicated thing, which, uh, you know, I, all of you teachers can contribute that. With the simulator, we need the ecosystem. Okay, so the theory, reference material, instructions on how to perform, help and feedback, all of these are things that you can certainly contribute to, you know, each of these labs. If you find that some places requires improvement, some things you have a better input on this, please do share with us. We will be happy to incorporate because it's a resource we have doing for the purpose of, you know, for the teachers and the students to uh, improve the quality of education, right? So here there is not much of a problem. You can use a simple text editor to, uh, to create all these material. Now, when it comes, when I talked about um, the, the software component, let's say if I want to talk, teach about uh, addition of numbers, Right. So typically, addition of numbers, you will create a grid like this. 
okay the four digit number 1027 plus 999 right so you don't want the student to tell the student okay tell me the answer because then i don't know what mistake you did how did you do mistake so as a lab activity what i would ask him to do is to fill this grid so he should do 7 plus 9 and write um, you know the value here and the carry you should actually put it there right so that way i can check that okay ha huh, you did uh, 7 plus 9 you did correctly the first the, um, uh, the unit place but you have forgotten the carry and that is why you got a wrong output right so i am able to give feedback in a constructive way to help him improve otherwise all you can do is to say that uh, sorry your answer is wrong try it again okay which is which is what you do in an exam mode so in order to be able to provide effective feedback all the way through you need to structure your um, you know inter interactions also in an appropriate level of granularity right so for a maths ad addition of um, uh, numbers in maths this is adequate level for me the only thing is i will ask him to fill the carry if at all whatever is available at appropriate places so i can check whether the carry at every point is correct the sum that he is doing is correct is he doing things in the right order so for example <clears throat> if before doing 7 plus 9 if he did 0 plus 6 for example 0 plus 9 for example i'll tell you sorry that is not where you start you should start by adding 7 plus 9 right so i can help him and this is the this is exactly the power that these tools provide yeah. similarly when i'm doing uh, for example a pendulum i have to look at all the forces that is acting on it the g the centrifugal force the tipical force the, all these forces have to be captured the equations have to be built and it has to be tracked as the pendulum move along so that i know when to stop the pendulum as it rises up and when to um, stop it on the other side so all these are actually computed real time as the movement happens and that is why we always call it a simulator and that is the challenge in building these kind of systems so building the simulator um, the, the one of the things that you will have to do is to decide the affordances what are the parameters which can be changed which uh, like the material the length uh, the all of the, these things you will have to identify what parameters you want uh, to allow uh, change to be changed at run time identify and design the components so if i say uh, uh, the blob or the ammeter how should it look like visually what is the behavior that should be um, exhibited by that so if you have an ammeter it must have two knobs to which i should be able to connect a wire okay that is the minimum behavior and then depending on the value of the current passing by the needle should deflect okay if it is a digital one it should show the value if it is a um uh, just the normal ammeter it should the needle deflection should vary accordingly right so that is the the visual appearance and it is the behavior of these uh, devices and what is the interface available for communicating with that device okay so the click in order to connect a wire or to watch the screen in order to take the reading right so these are all the kind of detailing that you will have to do in when in you building the simulator and then you have to design the sequence of steps required what should happen first what should happen next is that is it mandatory to do uh, the first before second can we allow the person to do uh, change the order because that will tell him the feedback if you are like in the maths case if you did the um, 10th place first before doing for the unit place i'll tell him sorry that's not the way to do it but when you want to you know let's say three multiplications have to be done you which multiplication you do is up to you there is no problem i don't have a constraint about the same sequence of steps that is required so design user intervention and feedback and uh, also look at uh, the difficulty areas that typically students have which you teachers know very well which are the uh, the challenging places so look at extra preview feedback at those stages for when when the student is performing the activity and also decide the measurements observations and all that that may be required if you are required to measure a length you will have to provide in some scale, for some uh, virtual scale right i cannot use a physical scale and measure it on the screen because if you zoom out or zoom in my readings will change right so you have to have a virtual scale you need a virtual protractor you need a virtual clock all that is required in order to support this activity okay so this is only when the whole, whole thing becomes usable as a lab okay so as you can see there is a fair amount of work involved so that is why it is not something that i would suggest for everybody to do 
but those of you who want to try uh, you know their hand with something i will show you uh, one of the uh, ways to do a simple labs using the, <clears throat> some tool okay so if you want to try okay so that is a big if if you want to try you can choose uh, tools like uh, GeoGebra and Scratch. Some of you might be familiar with this. These are both uh, very user-friendly uh, programming environments. Okay, so it does allow you to write programs like uh, software programs, but it is it doesn't it makes the process a little uh, simpler for you, a little comfortable for you to deal with. Both have what are called visual programming mechanism, so you don't have to worry too much about the syntax. Should I put a bracket here? Should I put a comma there? Should there be a semicolon here? All that hassles, you don't have to worry about it. You, you can focus on the, uh, you know, the basic constraints. Okay, I need to move. I need to close this. I need to, you know, produce a sound. I need to do the, all that things you can focus on. So both allow experimenting visually. Okay, so it, this is also nice. Those of you who are very uh, interested in, you know, the typical tinkering mode. So, you know, in, in, if you were to use, a, let's say, Python or C or Java or something, when you write a program and if there are errors in it, you are seriously in trouble, right? Because it won't compile. You don't know what to do with it. You'll have to go and take the help from an expert. The advantage about GeoGebra and, GeoGebra and the Scratch is that it is visual. So you can actually see what is going on. You can change it. You can stop it. You can, you know, rewrite some pieces. You can do all this fiddling. So you don't actually have to think of the entire program uh, up front and then come and try and put it in. Write one line at a time and you play around with it, slowly, slowly refining uh, what is required. Okay. The, the difficulty with these is that all the primitives are predefined. So what you can do with uh, these tools is that sense limited. So it is not like a generic programming language like uh, C or Java. You can do only certain kind of things. But that's good enough for you to do a lot of things that you would uh, want to play around with. Okay. So what can be done is limited. And uh, that, um, uh, against that to compromise, you are able to get to a, a very nice environment to work with. I'll show you a demo with uh, Scratch. I did, I did a small lab for you to understand uh, how these things work. So you can uh, also play around with it. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm going to show you uh, the tool called uh, Scratch. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, okay. Let me let me do. Uh, okay, I think I have. Okay, let me show you that uh, screen. So this is what a Scratch Scratch screen looks like. Okay, so when I open a Scratch uh, application, you can open this directly on the Scratch website, which is this. Okay, so um, uh, scratch.mit.edu. So you can go there. That's a public uh, free uh, software. You can download and install the system if you want on your laptop or desktop, or you can directly work it on online. You can also find how literally millions of projects that various people have done using Scratch and all the code, everything is available on the Scratch site. You can play around with it and you know, work with it. So, uh, the, the typical scratch mode of uh, programming is, uh, you know, to, is, is this kind of an environment. So you can divide, uh, so on the left are my tools that I will manipulate with. Okay, so the programming components, you can see move 10 steps, turn 15 degrees, go to random position, point and direction. So these are all commands I can tell to do something. Okay. The middle area is where I actually am writing my program. On this, uh, what looks like a stage is where I can see what I, the effect of what I have written. So this is the place where it shows the running thing and I can see whether I'm doing it correctly or wrong. And this allows me some, uh, you know, some affordances which I'm, I will require like stage and sprite, which I'll tell you a little bit uh, now. Okay, so this is the typical scratch area. I will actually show you live uh, on the screen uh, the same thing and we'll actually show you some uh, code also so you get a feel for it. <coughs> yeah, uh, Krishna Murthy is asking GeoGebra and uh, yeah, I think this the word is scratch. So now I think you got that. So uh, the way you program scratch is basically to think of a, a drama. Okay, you uh, what, a, what does a drama have? 
there is a stage okay and on which there are various actors that comes in they do something and then go away okay that's exactly what scratch does so in order for the drama to play take place i need a stage okay so that is called the background or the um, uh, but in scratch language is called the stage so in in this picture this little picture here this uh, green background is my stage okay so stage is basically a simple picture as far as scratch is concerned so we are not going to create a 3d uh, visual or something like that it's a simple picture you can put any kind of picture i'll show you examples of that once you have got your uh, stage this a stage can be a school it can be a hospital it can be your home it can be your bedroom it can be your study room whatever any of this right now you need the actors right so the actors which um, the actors which will come in various forms and they do various things and go back right these actors are called the sprites okay so scratch calls these actors by the term sprites and uh, these sprites are the characters which are live on the screen so like what happens in a drama these sprites you have to tell the sprite when to come to the screen what to do and when to go away okay so they come they do something and they go away so pretty much exactly like uh, how it happens in a drama now one of the things which is uh, which is kind of a compromise is this concept of a costume <clears throat> so usually for example you know uh, let's say i walk into a stage and then i listen to a dialogue then i have a different expression or uh, i might actually turn around and look at to somewhere somewhere other somewhere else now scratch in this case is a 2d model so i cannot um, you know create a 3d picture version of this uh, face for example and allow it to be turning and all that that's also happening now i think there is a scratch 3d uh, which is um, which i heard heard it is there but we will stick to our 2d okay so since it is a 2d a static picture is what i will attach a scratch, um, uh, sprite i want to show variations on that character right so the my sprite can be angry very uh, sad or uh, you know happy so i can actually create two three different variants of the same actor and they are called costumes so what happens is if i let's say if uh, one one sprite actually um, uh, cracks a joke this sprite can change and um, it can change into a happy mode right so you can change the costume basically so use uh, this concept of costumes to change appearance or perform action okay so you can um, you know uh, turn around you can change the expression you can even change your dress all of these are done by costumes so the background image and uh, the sprite and the costume these are the only three things that you will need to know to play around with a uh, uh, scratch now now what you need to do so you have to identify what is the background image which means you have to decide where that uh, activity is going to take place since we are talking about virtual labs presumably um, virtual labs are going to take place in a lab bench for example okay so like the exam picture i showed you it can be a laboratory bench right or it could be a stage right <coughs> so and uh, the sprites would be the equipments the um, you know the various things that you would, you would want to bring onto the stage so sprites here will not be physical um, you know what called a <coughs> animal um, animal characters like uh, in the case of a drama but it will be these equipments a beaker um, a pipette some chemical uh, repository whatever okay all that could be your sprites now you have to tell the sprite what to do so write a program for each sprite so this is where you are going to find it a little bit of challenge you have to tell the sprite what to do at each point so you can tell the sprite to say something it can take input it can move it can perform calculation it can change costumes a lot of things are predefined for you you can actually choose any of these options okay you also have some variables and you can have the sprites to talk to each other okay so um, like for example you want one sprite to enter when a sprite number 3 says hello for example right so that's a kind of communication 
So uh, what does Sprite 3 is saying? Uh, Sprite 1 cannot directly hear. So I will have to use some message to communicate. Okay. So but anyway, let's not worry too much about it. Let's focus on the basic parts. Okay, so with that uh, field, I'm going to take you to the, spy, uh, to the scratch screen and we'll spend a little bit of time uh, <coughs> working with the, uh, working with Sprite, uh, the, the scratch system, okay? I think for 44, so I think I can do so for 10 minutes more. Okay, so let me get out of uh, this and I will show you the scratch. Okay, so this is the same screen that I showed you. Okay, I hope it is visible, the same scratch screen. Someone can confirm? Yes, yes sir. sir, it oh, is. Good, good. Yeah, sometimes, you know, it takes time, so I am just confirming it. Otherwise, you will get lost. Okay, so um, so before I um, you know come back to uh, do this, let me show you something fresh to show you what these things actually look like. Okay, so I'm creating a new project now. So this is a completely empty screen. And typically, all the Scratch guys have this little cat here, and that is the default sprite that you get. So he's an actor. Okay, so I can tell him to do various things here. So let's say uh, I'm um, yeah. So as as what I said, I'm going to create a background first, right? I want a stage. So you see on this side, the stage on the right corner, uh, there is something called stage. Okay, and the below that there is something which says choose a background. So I'm going to click on that. Out of in there, I can search for a lab, um, backdrop. I can create one. I can uh, upload my own. So if you take a uh, picture of some nice uh, landscape or something, and you want to use that as your backdrop, perfectly fine, you can upload your picture, right? But I'm going to choose uh, one from what is available. So you can see Sprite has, uh, I mean, the Scratch has a lot of uh, backdrops which are available to you to play around, okay? So I'm going to choose uh, something, uh, I don't know, let's say I'm going to choose this uh, boardwalk. Okay, so the boardwalk will come. So this is the backdrop backdrop that I got, right? So now I'm going to make the sprite. It has got the one sprite predefined built in for me. So for the timing, let me just use that. Okay, so this is the sprite. You can see over here uh, certain controls are available. I can make the sprite bigger, smaller, and all that using these. Okay, now this sprite. Come back to the left. There is code, costumes, and sound. Okay, so on the costume side, you can see the picture. Okay, this is the bitmap of the same image. Now I can actually fiddle with it. Okay, and I can use this to create uh, different costumes. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to create uh, one more um, uh, costume. Let's say I'm going to do costume three. And uh, here I'm going to make this fellow, you know, some. I mean, just, just, just to give you a feel of it, okay? So I've given this and I'm going to save this as my costume three, right? So you can, uh, similarly, you can add more costumes. No, I don't want to choose a costume. Okay. Anyway, so I was uh, trying to see there is a way to create a new costume. Yeah, so I can create another uh, costume, which I'm calling called, called this thing one. So this one uh, is a different costume for that same uh, cat. Okay, and uh, you know, something like this. So I can, um, so I have three costumes for this fellow, this one, this one, and this one. And so I can switch them. Now I can write the program. So typically what I want to do is I want to, let's say, I want to tell this fellow to move forward. Okay. So 
so i have actually chosen uh, this is the last question that i use which is that's one i'm there so i can just do move 10 steps okay and i well, uh, okay so one of the things that you do in uh, in scratch to get some control over this because you are experimenting with is to use this two little things that you find here there is a green flag and there is a red uh, button there okay so while it is not mandatory for you to use it it is a good convention to whatever program that you do attach it to this flag okay so what i'm going to do is to put this and say so now my program says when flag is clicked move 10 steps right so now what happens i click on this flag it moves right it is moving 10 steps 10 steps 10 steps 10 steps 10 steps now i can go and tell this fellow okay uh, say hello <clears throat> okay so it will move 10 steps then say hello and then uh, wait wait there right and uh, let me see i can also move it to uh, turn 5 15 sec uh, degrees okay so i'm going to make this yellow rotate and uh, let me see if I can get that other costume here for, for, uh... okay, now let's see what happens, right? So it moved 10 steps, it has switched to this costume, it says hello, and it turns 15 degrees, right? And I do one more click, 10 steps hello and turn to 15 degrees again so you can you can do this now you can do more sophisticated ones by there are uh, controls available so you can ask to do the same thing forever okay so i can actually and now see what happens okay i put a loop saying do this forever okay so if i do <coughs> it'll keep on doing that Okay, I'm doing some assault and all that things that you will do there because there's no control. Now, if I want to stop this, I just click on this red button. It is done, stopped. Okay, so you don't have a problem that you will suddenly bring the crash the computer or anything. You click that red button, whatever program is running, it will stop. Okay, when you attach a program to run, always put it to attach it to this green flag so that. Only when you click the green flag, your program will run. And when you click the red flag, it will stop. Okay. So this is this is essentially what the scratch uh, way of working is. So you can have multiple scry um, uh, sprites coming on the screen. They can talk to each other. Now I can sort of switch the um, stage. So for example, um, uh, let's say when the sprite goes to the right end, I can switch to a different uh, costume, for example. Okay. And there is enormous amount of primitives available to you. So, for example, what you find it very difficult is um, um, the, the, yeah, so there is also, I can check whether a key is pressed or not. But let me see. Um, yeah, when, um, when I can, uh, Start off, okay, events. Yeah, so I, when um, uh, I can ask whether when if I'm touching the mouse pointer, I should do something else, right? So I can actually put these kind of conditions here. So you can do this touching mouse pointer or touching the <coughs> edge. So I can put a condition saying that if you, while moving, if you touch the edge, change the direction, uh, play some song. So lot of conditional options are available. You can check for key press. You can check for values to be um, uh, you know, right or wrong. You can pick random numbers. You can set up your own uh, variables, conditionals, events, and the backdrop can be changed. Move position can be done. Sound can be used. You can even record your own sound. And I play that uh, in in uh, as part of the program. Okay, so for example, um, I'm going to yeah. So I'm going to record a new sound. 
Okay. Oh, that's all right. Okay. That. Oh, that's all right. Okay. Hello. Oh, I think I have it. Can you hear me? I think I might have lost it. Yes, yes sir. Oh, I can hear. Okay, okay. I thought when I switched the mic, it got lost. So here is what I've uh, recorded. Right. So the record. Excuse me, sir. The recorded sound was not audible. I think that may not play. But anyway, so I will I'll leave it to you to check it out because that I think I have to share that uh, sound stream. So you can record uh, your own messages in your own form. Okay, you can put it in Tamil or Kannada or Telugu or whatever that you want. You can record it and use that as feedback in your uh, application also. Okay. Uh, I am going to run out of time now. So what? So um, you can write your own program. You can define your own sprites. You can define their costumes. You can define your stages and even transition those stages as, as you feel like. You can create your, create your own uh, audio. You can play a music if you want. You can create your own uh, messages. So all of these basically gives you a, a simple environment for in which you can actually play around with all this. Okay, with that, let me show you the program that I have written for you. And uh, yeah, I'm going to switch to let's okay. So here is here is the program that uh, I had actually made for you. So this is a simple way to build uh, the focal length of a, uh, a lens. Okay, so I've, I've made it very simple so that it is not very complicated and I'm also not doing a lot of graphic exercises. So what I have done in this case is to find the focal length of a mirror. As you said, <clears throat> as I mentioned, you need a stage. So I've chosen this blackboard as a stage for me. Okay, so this is my stage and that's the only stage I'm going to do. Now, as I mentioned, the only actor that I really need is the uh, screen which I will move to see whether the image is coming properly or not. Okay, because the lens is fixed, the table is fixed, so I don't need to create them as sprites. So I have actually modified this backdrop. So you can, uh, I'll show you the backdrop. Uh, so this backdrop, I have actually modified it by adding. Um, with uh, a lens into it. Okay. So this lens I have added and I also drew a line uh, as my bench. Okay. So this is this is my backdrop. This purple uh, with a cross is actually my sprite. Okay. So I will let me go back to sprite. So this is my sprite that I have chosen. Okay. So the idea is uh, again very simple. So uh, what I want to simulate is that uh, as the screen moves along those lines, some place where the screen is at the focal length of that mirror, of that lens, you will get a tick mark on the, uh, on the screen. Okay. You should ideally get a proper uh, image and all that, but that all requires more uh, work and you will get more complicated. So I have created, basically done this by a simple technique. I've created two sprites. I mean, two costumes. Okay, both have the same purple background, but one has a tick mark on it and uh, the other one has a cross in it. So what I'm going to do is allow the user to move this uh, screen uh, along this line. And when, when it is at a position which is equal to the focal length, the I, it will switch costume to the tick mark one. Okay. Let's see what happens and then I'll explain to you more, more than that. So you see the message, okay, move me left and right till the cross changes to a tick. Okay, so I'm, you are going to use uh, these arrow keys to do the movement. So I'm going to move it, uh, huh. see, it has become a tick. But if I move further, it is now uh, cross only. 
so i can bring it back if i missed it and at some point in time it will become a tick and if i go back go beyond that it will back to a cross now what you can also see is for your information i have to put the screen sec position the focal length <coughs> the focal length of this lens i am changing it every time i'm running the program okay so that you don't actually uh, take one fixed position and say i know that is the focal length right so every time i run for example i let me run it once more now my focal length has got to 40 so now if i move a little bit it will not become red uh, it will not become green i will to move further now it has become because see the distance to lens and distance to f value are approximately <coughs> <coughs> same okay so what i have done is that when this image screen is at position x such that it is very close to the f value change the costume to tick otherwise change the costume to cross okay i'll show you the code of that okay uh, yeah so this is the all that is there in the program I'll I'll explain to you briefly. Then I, this code is available online on the Scratch website, so you can go and play it or play with it. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I always start a Scratch code with a green flag click because at that point everybody will be synchronized, right? So when green flag is click, set size to thirty percent because this one I had created a little bigger, so I set it to one standard size so that experiment is done. Go to minus hundred and minus fifty five. So you can see every time when I start, it always comes to that position. So that is because of this go to switch costume to wrong. Okay, so initially it will come with this uh, wrong, which is the cross costume. I, I've named the two costumes as wrong and right, so it's much easier for you to understand. And then you should send a message, say move me dag 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 for five seconds. You can see that has happening. See this message will come for five seconds. then the message will go right then forever repeat this okay so look at this forever which means uh, this this experiment will never stop okay i can keep moving it left and right as many times as i want till i click the stop button okay so forever first wait until any key is pressed okay i should wait for a key press which is what is there so you can see that the code is very readable in that sense right as i am um, uh, reading the code you can understand what i am trying to do there wait and wait till any key is pressed if the key pressed this left arrow which means i should move to the left i should do something if it is right arrow i should do something else what is that i do i should change the position by minus 5 or plus 5 so left arrow is pressed change x by minus 5 if right arrow is pressed change x by plus 5 and set the new distance length and that is the length, distance length that you are computing here if that is within a short i mean within 10 units of the focal value switch the costume to right otherwise switch the costume to wrong that is all my program does but it works like a simple way of doing a uh, focal length of a mirror okay so i won't uh, elaborate too much you please experiment with it and so that um, i can finish through my presentation okay a few more slides and then we are done for the day okay open board <coughs> all right so yeah so we are actually in the process of uh, you know introducing mechanisms for to, to use labs as an evaluation mechanism so you can tell your student go and do this lab then i will go online and check what you did and you know give you marks proper and timely guidance um, so uh, there will be some uh, kind of a avatar or something on the screen which will tell you what is to be done what you what you are doing wrong collaboration immersive experience so we the further labs you can expect uh, augmented reality virtual reality and all that also it coming in and uh, we are also trying to bring in some gamification ideas uh, in, to retain interest and as somebody asked in the beginning we want to do non science subjects okay so these are all being explored in the labs which are coming coming up uh, in the days to come so in, in terms of guidance it is modeling labs or uh, this thing so um looking at a guided lab like an avatar giving you some inputs or peer lab when you have two students at the same time in the lab 
virtually they can talk to each other and help in uh, this so these are uh, some more things that we are looking at and uh, moving for more into more inclusive uh, labs we are trying to look at uh, gesture as a way of controlling movements and things on the screen so i can turn a, a bunsen burner by actually turning a virtual knob rather than going and clicking a mouse button somewhere using speech and haptic devices so some of these things are also we looking at gamification uh, bringing up uh, game ideas so mathematics languages social sciences all of these are things that we are exploring so uh, this one i actually want to even make an offer to you because social sciences is a little hard to visualize what could be good labs so if those of you who are into social sciences please let us know what kind of activities would you like to see in the under social sciences maths and languages we have some fairly good idea but there also we can take your comments so if you have any thoughts on what are good uh, ideas which you can experiment for social science labs let us know and we will be happy to incorporate them so you can help even if building a lab is complicated there are many ways to help in this endeavor share ideas where a lab activity would be appropriate beyond the listed labs share areas of difficulty commonly felt so we can introduce more help of, of uh, options in at that times in the lab environment share common misconceptions or challenges that students face so this also can be factored in when we build affordances and interventions help by reviewing the labs as they get ready and help improve the language feedback explanation so anything that you find in the lab as it comes along please do let us know and we will be very happy to take your feedback and build it better because our intention is only that you should be able to find it very useful and our students should be able to get a better learning experience than ever before so <clears throat> with that i think i'll stop with the presentation so if there are any of you have some questions or want to do something maybe next few minutes or something we will i can do otherwise uh, we can uh, wind up over to you nithi thank you so much sir for this informative session and definitely after this session Uh, definitely after this session teacher and teacher educators will use and develop simulators uh, simulations uh, more efficiently so that students will understand the concept in a better way and will be able to apply the knowledge so uh, if there are any questions you can ask till the time uh, um, either you can raise your hand or you can write it in the chat box yeah i i, I can keep an eye on the chat box Okay. Good. Uh, thank There you. There is one question: Do we need to register to access the O labs? No, you don't need to register. Some places it may ask you what is your name or something, but that is just for uh, information sake. So even if you write anything, it doesn't matter. You can get access. And on the Diksha, there is absolutely no no registration or checks being made. So anybody can access it. Uh, there is one more question do states have permission to localize the content available in olaps portal um yeah i yeah i did answer this uh, along the way so basically uh yeah i'm seeing <coughs> other comments also so localization has two components if you are asking about the translating the content into local languages absolutely fine <coughs> because um, yeah, you, you can i mean we can give you the text in english or hindi you can give it <coughs> in the language we can incorporate it and the whole uh, system will be available in that language if you want to localize by changing the flow or you know maybe creating a different interface that's a little more complicated because um, you uh, um, um, i mean but you will actually need to change, modify the software so which will take uh, some effort but tell us if there are any inputs like that we will see what we can factor in there okay and um, so if you want to contribute what to do i given you one last uh, slide uh, what all the things that you can uh, do about it okay i think a lot of uh, small questions are coming let me see if we can do i can pick up a few of them um is olab open source it is free to use by anybody okay to that extent it is open but the source code we are not throwing it open because you know somebody may tamper with it and if the simulation is manipulated then it won't work as we expected so we are not okay. throwing open the code for public but other than that it is free to use you can use anywhere anytime 
we are even dis been distributing uh, cd versions or pen drive versions of it so you can even install it in your school and uh, use it there is no problem with that i call relate olab and scratch you know there is no relation between them scratch is a visual programming language and as i said olab uh, has virtual lab also requires a lot of programming so ideally you would use uh, scratch I mean, um, java or c or you know uh, python or something to do this programming that is requires very specialized skill so if some of you want to play around with it scratch is a visual programming environment which gives you some basic programming capability with which you can build lab so like what i did in the demonstration i built a simple lab to find focal length of a mirror using scratch programming right so such things can potentially be tried if you are interested in it okay so because uh, this is content creation also so that was the idea sharing that social studies uh, so vasanta ji i think what i would suggest is that my my email address is there on the last slide so please send me a mail i'll connect with you and uh, you can give me your inputs on uh, you know what social studies we want to use yeah and same thing for uh, mohammed mustafa also uh, please write to me i will i'll tell you what 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 way you can help with us can we import images from out of source yes you can pick up your own photographs images uh, you can draw your own images all of that is possible okay so in scratch after design games can i get output as an application mode that i don't think scratch allows you to do so you will have to play it within the scratch environment itself all apps is currently not available in mobile well actually there is a mobile app available but you know in order to do a lab you need some screen area if you do a normal uh, you know uh, this much of space it is very difficult to play around with any adequate manipulation area for uh, lab so it is not recommended for the small footprint mobiles but if you have a tablet or you know big screen uh, mobiles then that is fine okay contribution i already told you my question is regarding scratch yeah just go ahead and tell me whatever is the question i will try to answer olab is not downloadable because it's a huge bandwidth but uh, you know uh, we will see what way we can make available uh, offline versions of it <clears throat> can you give idea about pollination of flower that i think you should ask a biology teacher I, i don't think i can do but there may be a lab in it so you can check that out so there is a lab for pollination we are very much aware yeah okay okay so i think uh, if you have a doubt about the content please ask your biology biology teacher okay because if i talk about pollination no it, yeah. i can answer excuse me sir i can answer for this if she requires to ah uh, uh, yeah okay please go ahead so in class 12th you can find an experiment which is here related to pollination in fact there are two experiments which are related to pollination and resources are available on virtual lab simulations are also available so you can go through them class 12th bio hi ma'am it's not about the about the content ma'am i was uh, i just want yeah. to create an uh, scratch project uh, over the pollination okay i need uh, some background and the flower and honey bee so i can so i just needed an idea and now that you can uh, ma'am on, on the on the scratch uh, there you can find lots of images and all that or you can draw some simple honey bee you know with your uh, with a pen sketch and you just upload it so oh, you can see okay. that also okay well, that's oh. not a problem oh thank you or you can download uh, images from google which are available for free oh, like that is also you fine. must have got to know how to download uh, free images you can do so and you can upload like sir already told how to upload Okay, so, ma'am. Thank you. Primary classes, it is not yet done. Currently, the ones available are for class nine, ten, eleven, twelve. But the class six to twelve is what is now coming up, and maybe eventually others will also get added. We are also encouraging engineering college students and all that to build the labs and contribute. So yeah, keep uh, watching. Uh, um, we we will get everywhere. Um, fantastic! A direct link of watching these on Diksha platform. yeah that i think monica has already answered so i am going to leave you there email id in chat box i am going to give you that um, shashi at cdac.in or you can also access me at gmail 
uh, this is an ID. I'm sure you will not forget the little sassy at uh, gmail.com. Okay, there are very few little sessions in the universe, so you will be able to remember them. Uh, great to know, virtual labs. Human internal organ functioning. Yeah, I think some of this will also come. Um, duck, duck, duck. Okay, I think that's it. I, I have actually answered all your questions, I think. Okay, so, so thank you uh, very much. And uh, keep writing to me. Uh, you have my email address, so if there is anything that we can do. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, sir, once again. And uh, I would like to request all the participants. You can see that I have sent a link for quiz related to this session. I have sent it in the WhatsApp group also and in this chat box also. And this link will stay live till 6 p.m. today. So you are having around 45 minutes and there are a few questions to answer. So attempt this link and at six o'clock, we will close the link. Thank you so much. Uh, over to Pinky. Miss Pinky. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for such an informative session. Now we'll close the day today, but uh, would like to tell that for tomorrow,